Hi, my name is Andrea Leach, and I'm coming from Oklahoma, which is in the middle of the United States. I'm sure many of you have not been there, um, but it's actually a beautiful place. And this is my first time in Poland, so I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm in Oklahoma because I'm currently the chief marketing officer at the Oklahoma Aquarium, which has the largest collection of bull sharks in the entire world, fun fact, found in Oklahoma. Um, but I'm actually here today to talk about my experience at National Geographic, where I was most recently for the last 10 years overseeing uh, digital storytelling related to travel. So that means people, places, cultures. It was a fabulously fun job to actually inspire people to get, actually go travel the world. Um, but that's all done, too, in some really interesting creative ways with technology. And so National Geographic is a legacy brand. Um, part of it is nonprofit, part of it is for profit. So really I think this applies to no matter if you're a legacy brand or a startup or anything in between. Um, I think some of these uh, pieces and examples that I will show you today will hopefully be an inspiring to you and your organization. Because no matter where you are, you do have a story to be told and to be shared. Because ultimately, you want people to engage with what you're doing, and you want them to also care about what you're doing. And so everything we did with storytelling at National Geographic was to do that, to make them care about our mission, and to then be inspired to then go do good. So hopefully you enjoy this today. So I'll start with the very beginning of National Geographic. So the National Geographic Society was actually started in 1880, 1888 actually, and it was started by a few researchers and scientists, and they were very interested in spreading and increasing knowledge related to geography. And soon after they started this group of scientists and researchers in Washington, D.C., which is where the headquarters are currently still based, in the same building where they first started, um, they created, a few months later, the first National Geographic magazine, which you can see here. And hopefully most of you are familiar with the National Geographic magazine today. This does not have the iconic yellow border that you see but it has evolved greatly through the years. But the first issue actually had six articles, and these articles still had the same enthusiasm for science and exploration that still persists 130 years later to this day. And so what's also really important to know, after the first National Geographic magazine came out, and it had no pictures, which again, it's evolved in many ways through the years, um, is that one of the first founders was actually re received a grant. And the first grant from National Geographic is really important because that kind of became the catalyst to all of the amazing stories that you now read in National Geographic magazine to this day. And so the first grant was provided to a founder who actually went out to map the area around one of the second highest mountains in North America. And ever since he first went on that first trip, 14,000 grants have now been provided to all kinds of people in terms of pursuing passions related to education, conservation, storytelling, research, so many different avenues of opportunity of exploration. And to this day, we continue to do that and also receive some really, really impactful empowering stories from the field from these grants. One of the most exciting grants, in my opinion, was the discovery of Machu Picchu, well, which was funded in part from National Geographic. Now this was discovered by Hiram Bingham, and it was in the early 1900s, and it was for the first time we actually had an explorer going out into the field capturing things had never, that had never been seen before. For example, this is what Hiram Bingham first found when he got to Machu Picchu, which was covered, obviously, by a lot of uh, lush greenery, which has now been cleaned up today and is what you're familiar with now, the beauty of Machu Picchu, one of the greatest world wonders, in my opinion. But it was also the first time that National Geographic magazine dedicated an entire issue 
to a one discovery. And in large part of it was because of the amazing photos that he captured during that discovery. Other grants that have been really important to National Geographic and to the storytelling there have involved everything from cartography and maps, which mapping is still one of the most important aspects of what we do at National Geographic to this day. There's a very large cartography group who still update maps on a daily basis. But most importantly for the World Wars, the maps that National Geographic created during the World Wars was extremely important in many ways. And also supplying grants to the first American to summit Everest, or to Dr. Jane Goodall, who did behavioral work with uh, chimpanzees in Tanzania, or to Dr. Bob Ballard, who discovered the Titanic in the North Atlantic Ocean. All of these were provided through grants for National Geographic and later became incredible stories that continue to be told, uh, whether it's Dr. Jane Goodall or Dr. Bob Ballard to this day. And I think this is really important to show because National Geographic is a very visual brand. So much of what we do is based around photography. And so this is the first photo that actually appeared in the magazine. Uh, many say this is, uh, but a relief map was actually the first. Um, but this was kind of the beginning of the evolution of National Geographic becoming a very visual brand and taking people to places that they had never seen before. National Geographic magazine started producing these photos. And all these photos were taken on the expeditions with grants provided. which also evolved into eventually from black and white to autochrome. This was taken by Eliza Skidmore, who was, one of the who was the first female to join the National Geographic Society. And she was both an explorer and a photographer. And her work in Japan with her autochrome was actually really important when the United States was working with Japan. And together, they were able to bring thousands of cherry blossom trees, which is now the reason why the Tidal Basin in Washington, D.C. is such an iconic place to see cherry blossoms in the United States, all because of this work done by Eliza, Eliza Skidmore around photography in Japan. And obviously, this is one that is very iconic. Hopefully, many of you have seen this. It was taken by photographer Steve McCurry, and it's of a young Afghan woman. She's about 12 years old. And he caught this during a refugee crisis when she was fleeing her home of Afghanistan and going to Pakistan. And he caught this image, and it later became the cover of the June 1985 issue of National Geographic magazine. And she became a poster child of what was happening during that global crisis, or during that crisis in that area. And it's interesting because no one knew what happened to her for many years until a few years ago, the photographer did find her again. She's now a, a woman in her mid to late 40s and has her own children. And only recently did she relocate to back home from Pakistan to Afghanistan. And what's fascinating is that she had no idea her picture had been taken and had been seen by millions around the world. Now she's very aware, but um, it's great to see a story come full circle and see that she's doing well. But photography, which became the first kind of technology used by National Geographic was the way for the company itself and the society to share, again, these great stories that were going on based on grants given to explorers, these bold explorers who are going out into the field and using photography. So having evolved from black and white to autochrome to more color, to technology that enabled people to go underwater to the deepest parts of the world, or allowing people to go into the deepest cave system, and even getting a bird's eye view. This is taken in Yellowstone National Park. It's an absolutely beautiful photo of one of the hot springs there. But as you can see, technology with photo has evolved and in many years, many years ago, you wouldn't have been able to do that. And, you know, drones today can let you see things with a bird's eye view. And even with that, 
this is the Great Barrier Reef, we're evolving to a world where it's not just about print photography, it's also about video and how you can incorporate video. So even within the storytelling space at National Geographic, all of this has evolved tremendously. It's not just print, it's also very much a digital world. And so with that, we started experimenting a few years ago. This was created for desktop, and it's a way I, overseeing the travel team, we're always inspiring people to go and experience places that they've never seen before. But it's also particularly important to help those who might not have the economic means or physical abilities to go travel. And we wanted to make people feel somewhat immersed while we were creating this piece of content for desktop. And I say desktop because I'll get to mobile in a moment. This was really important because this piece was created in conjunction with both the magazine, but also the print team. And as you can see, this is an illustrated travel log that's also animated. So you can see it in the print product, but it's flat pictures, flat imagery, and so you don't have quite the same experience as you would see on digital, which I think is really important as well. And this was taken by a photographer who we sent to go on the longest train ride in India. And he captured this with beautiful images and he went into the field and he was even able to capture some really interesting um, video footage from the window. And the way things work at National Geographic is if you have an idea of what you want to go into a print publication there, National Geographic magazine or Traveler magazine, it takes about two or three years to actually see it come to fruition once it starts. So it was really exciting for us to actually build this out on digital first and then to eventually see it in print about a year later. And I said digital uh, design is extremely important for mobile. Most of your customers are coming in or users are coming in through their mobile device through their smartphone. In fact, no matter where you work or the size of your organization, I would guarantee that 60% of your audience are actually using their smartphone to come to your website and to see what you're doing. So it's extremely important that no matter what content you're creating, that you're thinking about it on a phone. So everything you should do, you should check your phone with the design as opposed to just looking at the desktop because they're two very different experiences. I showed the one from Ireland first and that does not look the same at all on mobile. So always think about mobile. And as I show this, still speaking of the grants, a grant provided this beautiful story to a scientist turned photographer, turned explorer at National Geographic to create some amazing imagery of hummingbirds that had never been seen like this ever before. And mobile made that, the technology that um, comes with smartphones really al allows it to see um, this in a totally new way that you wouldn't otherwise see in print. And also VR is really important to storytelling as well. Right around the time I was leaving, we had been in many conversations talking with another explorer out in the field in the Okavanga region who's doing some con con conservation work. Um, his name's Dr. Steve Boys, and he's been down there for a few years. But we were working with him around some VR, and it's just another way to share stories that you might not be able to see otherwise in um, a print product, for example. And so this is just an example of it. It's okay. It's okay. And so the team is working on more opportunities so that you can feel like you're in the field with these explorers as well, which I think is fascinating. And there's definitely more to come there. 
And then I'm sure most of you are part of Instagram, and I am proud to say that National Geographic has the largest following in the world for a brand on Instagram. Again, it's now a very visual brand, and it has been for many decades. Um, but one of the greatest ways to utilize it, for us in particular, as I said, it takes months, maybe years, to actually print a story in National Geographic magazine. But you can start the journey right away with Instagram stories. And another great thing about it is that you get immediate feedback about how people care about that particular topic. So you know that before the story is even published, either in print or even online. So it's great engagement to follow. And this is an example of one of the stories that we created. Hello, my name is Charlie Hamilton James, and today I'm on assignment for National Geographic. This is Roy. Roy's mum was killed with a poison arrow in the Masai Mara. And uh, Roy didn't seem to like me very much. She just butted me out of the way while she was trying to eat. And so again, it's just a great way to bring your audience into the that story nice. before it's even published. And this was one that was really popular. Once it was finally published a year and a half later, we were able to resurface this content again to bring it to life in another new way. Another great asset is Facebook. And while I would love Facebook and it's not great to rely entirely on Facebook as a way to build engagement and audience because the algorithm is constantly changing, it's still one of the best ways to engage and build community. So for example, um, I also was overseeing not just the travel storytelling team, but I also oversaw the culture and exploration team. And one thing that we launched last summer was a Facebook group through National Geographic called Women of Impact. And this was a way for women to share their stories with one another about women and it include, can include themselves doing really impactful things in the world. And so it was amazing to see this being built in that so many women are so like-minded, but they also were learning so much about each other and connecting with each other in entirely new ways. In fact, I love showing this first picture because these two women connected through this Facebook group and then later met in person during their travels. So it's a way to connect globally as well. And it's a great idea to create a subgroup if you have an existing Facebook page for those who have like-minded ideas and can discuss more things that align with their likeness. Another great tool to use with Facebook is Facebook Live. And it's my understanding that some of these sessions today are going to be used on Facebook Live. But it's also another great tool for engagement and to see engagement taking place in real time. And the example I'm about to show you was one that we uh, sent one of our colleagues to what is one of the highest bridges in the Northern Hemisphere. And she got up there and we thought there's no way anyone would really be this interested in a steel bridge based in West Virginia in the United States. But it turns out that it was one of the most popular Facebook lives that we had ever done. And I think it's because it was such a curious place with so many anomalies to it. And because as you'll see, the weather was blowing 
the bridge was shaking. She was very frightened, but she kept very self-composed. And it's a great opportunity for you to get your staff out there sharing stories from the field, whether it's from the highest bridge or something else that you think is really curious that your audience would be interested in. Well, Marie, we are in wild, wonderful West Virginia. We are on the New River Gorge Bridge. And again, it's a great way to see live engagement and feedback and those <laughs> analytics coming in that can we help you the sky. There are so many incredible superlatives then that devise other great Facebook the Live opportunities. third longest single arch bridge in the world. Well, it's the third highest bridge in the country, mm -hmm. the 13th highest bridge in the world. And so again, it was very low budget, but it was one of our most popular Facebook Lives. So it's always good to also find the curious things that you think your audience might be interested in, no matter if you're a nonprofit, for profit. It's amazing. And we're sitting here over this river that is also the second oldest. And it's also smart to think about creating content. Um, that, is, that works for several platforms or that is platform specific. So for example, Twitter, we create videos specific for Twitter. However, oftentimes we're able to use that video on Facebook as well. So it's always good to think about multi-platform use of content, but also to think about, and I'll talk about this in a session this afternoon, how do you curate content specific to certain social channel, channels that you're working on because you obviously can't be on every single social channel all the time. And even if you're thinking about using video, it's also always important to think about using photos to then create the video. It's an easy hack to do. And another great thing about technology is that it gives you so many opportunities to create new things. One of our former editor-in-chiefs, Chris John, who was also a photographer and spent many years of his career in the field shooting for National Geographic before he came back to our headquarters, he had this great idea to create a space where people, uh, mostly amateur photographers, could share their images with one another and have a conversation with National Geographic photographers and photo editors and get critiqued for that, which then would help them become better photographers. This is right around when Instagram was starting, and it's different than Instagram because you get real-time feedback from National Geographic photographers and photo editors. And so it's really been exciting to see this community thrive thanks to all of this technology of digital itself and having such a great um, outreach of followers to connect with. And to this day, there are, I believe, well over a million followers or participants who are part of the Earshot community. And the great thing about Earshot is that all you have to do is sign up, share some of your pictures, and use particular hashtags. And the National Geographic photo editors actually go in and take those pictures, and they're featured in National Geographic magazine, and occasionally have even been featured on covers of Traveler magazine. So it's a great opportunity for up-and-coming photographers. And so technology, I think, is so important in that you have the opportunity to connect with different cultures and to actually see cultures in a new light. So many people, unfortunately, don't have the access to travel or those who even do. It's a world where you can really connect with so many different people, whether they're like-minded or not. And technology allows us to do that even more so, even though it's important to also get to go out and experience it for yourself. And it's important to remember that we're part of a very large global community and that we're all part of this together. And so I think that's why it's so important to be present on digital, to share your stories so that people can join the conversation and join the dialogue. And it doesn't have to be a lot of money spent to make things look super fancy. Again, I showed you very low budget Instagram stories and Facebook Lives and Twitter. There's so much that you can do and it makes people care, which I think is the most important aspect of using technology. So what I find really interesting about this, for example, it's a video that was done 
and created it with a smartphone. And when we shared it with content and context, it was really important for us to see how this low budget use of smartphone could help people start a conversation, a dialogue, and engage with one another. And so I think what's really important for all of us here is that we all have a story to share with one another. We all have an audience of people who we want to engage with and build relationships with. And so it's important to do that be by creating this content, whether it's low budget or high budget, but it's always good to go low budget, even at large corporations and companies like National Geographic, we were always looking to do it low budget, um, so that people engage with what you're doing and care. And so I really appreciate you talking with me, or me sharing this with you today, because again, I think it's really important that all of you know that even if you don't think you're a storyteller, you are a storyteller, because you are representing your brand, your organization, and you need to share those stories with the world, because that's how you're going to get people to care about your mission and to engage with your organization. So thank you so much. I really appreciate talking to you today, and I hope to see you at my seminar this afternoon.